Welcome to Lessons in Dyslexic Thinking, conversations with some of the world's most inspiring dyslexics, where we learn what dyslexic thinking is and how we can employ it to change the world. I'm joined by space scientist and space communicator, Dr. Maggie Adairin Pocock. Maggie, your curiosity and wonder about space has taken you to amazing places. You've said that my dyslexic thinking means I don't just think outside the box, I think outside the planet. I love that quote. Tell me, how has your dyslexic thinking helped you in what you do? Yes. Well, I think one of the aspects of dyslexia is I do many different things. And I think that is sort of part of the dyslexia. I'm fascinated by everything, an ongoing curiosity. And that sort of drove me into space science in the first place. Um, I got the space bug when I was a child. Um, started with the clangers and then Star Trek. Moon landings played an important role there. But I've always been curious and wanting to understand how things work. You know, sort of taking things apart, problem solving as well. And so in my space science, I really feel that um, uh, uh, the, the dyslexia drives me on. And it's things like working on the James Webb Space Telescope, largest space telescope ever built. And I'm just one of the 10,000 scientists that have worked on, participated in sort of building that. And I, I was working on something called an integral field unit, an IFU, which is a, a little unit that looks at something like a galaxy. And it will slice the galaxy up and then analyze the light uh, and so stretch it out into its component colors so we can analyze the galaxy, analyze the core of the galaxy, the edges of the galaxy. So making or creating something like that uh, and, and project managing something like that involves sort of problem solving, you know, things go wrong along the way and so we need to sort of come out with workarounds. And, but it's just the glory of being able to sort of understand the universe in a better way. So I can see the dyslexia coming out in all, um, all aspects of that work. <laughs> So it's curiosity and exploring as well, isn't it? Many great explorers are made by dyslexia as well. So um, how does that feed into how you think? Oh, so ex exploration is, I think, yes, a key, because it is trying to find um, what lies beyond and finding different ways of doing it. And it's quite interesting, because when people report on science, they report of, yes, the success of the James Webb Space Telescope. But on that journey, there are so many failures, so many pitfalls. But it is having that big goal, that crazy dream, and that's what drives you on. So I've seen it in my work, like the James Webb Space Telescope, but also in my life. Um, growing up, I went to 13 different schools. And um, with dyslexia, I was just thought of as a, a dumb black kid and put at the back of the class. So, you know, with the safety scissors and the glue. But I think having, I think dyslexics are visionaries and we have those big, crazy dreams. And that allows us to say, OK, yeah, we're, we're at the back of the class now, but that's where I want to be. So, yeah, how do I work out a way or route, work out a route to get there? So I think that really helps. It helps you drive on. But having that vision in the first place, I think um, I like to, uh, when I go out and see kids, I like to um, get them to have a desire to aspire, to have a big, crazy dream and see where it leads them. And so that's why I do so much science communication, going out and, and speaking to kids. I think I've seen uh, um, over sort of 450,000 people in the last 18 years. And a couple of weeks ago, to celebrate British Science Week, I saw 50,000 kids in a week. It was knackering. Wow. <laughs> some of it was online, some of it was live. But, but also it's the storytelling as well. Because and when you go out and see a group of kids and you want to inspire them, what stories can you tell? What can you tell them about the science to sort of draw them in and make them curious and make them want to join us and find out things themselves? Yes, because science is all about imagination, isn't it? It isn't about the boring facts and figures. Some of those things are important, of course, but it's all about imagination and seeing what could be, not what is. Yes, and, and I, what I love telling the kids is there's so much we don't know and so many challenges we still have to face. Uh, my my favourite one is uh, that we don't know what 94% of the universe is made of. We know what 6% of the universe is made of because it interacts with um, electromagnetic waves, it interacts with light, and so we can see that. The other 94%, um, we don't know what it is. And so I like to inspire kids to sort of think outside the box. What could it be? Why doesn't it interact with light? You know, ask them to sort of get them to grapple with these questions and uh, sort of inspire the next generation of curious scientists. <laughs> and how do you think education fits into that at the moment? Because it's very much putting children into, into boxes that, that don't fit. What do you think education should be doing? Because obviously you did very well in education because you became a doctor, so you managed to get through. 
yes. Um, and I think I managed to get through with lots of help and support uh, from, uh, uh, from family, especially at home. My mum and my dad were sort of real inspirations for me. Uh, teachers who went above and beyond realised I, I was struggling in some areas and so gave extra help. Uh, having that crazy dream drives you on. Um, for, for a while, uh, when I was studying for my GCSEs, I didn't watch TV for two years because I was determined, you know, if I could get sort of the GCSEs, that would be the next step in getting into space. So, you know, I need to focus on this. So lots of help and support. But I think schools need to change, change the way we do things. At the moment, it is very much about sort of, you know, we, uh, we teach, we test, we go forward. Whereas there's so many other things. Uh, as a space scientist sort of working uh, actually in industry, it's quite interesting because I meet kids that come along and I say, okay, so I'm going to give you a scenario. What, what, do, you think, um, what do you think might happen in science? How would you solve this problem? And they sort of look at me a bit blankly and say, yeah, we didn't cover that in the syllabus. <laughs> and so we're blinkering kids' thinking. We're not teaching them how to think. We're teaching them how to regurgitate facts and figures. And that's no good for anyone. So dyslexics have the imagination, the power to sort of succeed things differently to visualize and so that's the what we should be nurturing in everyone that creativity and that's what's lacking at the moment and the problem is it's very easy to teach okay you know this is a fact one plus one is two you get a tick in the box um, you get the exam it's hard to sort of measure creativity to measure innovation so schools sort of shy away from that but that's what we need to embrace because that's what we need in the future yeah, absolutely. We know that dyslexic thinking or dyslexic children have exactly the thinking the future needs. There's lots of work to do there. We're losing them on the way because of the education system as it stands. What was it about space that fascinated you? There were so many things. Um, firstly, it is just that, that wonder. Um, it's, um, when I came in earlier, I was distracted because I saw the moon outside the window and I was <gasps> just mesmerised. And I heard about the moon landings when I was growing up. And I decided then and there, yeah, I'm going to go to the moon. But then I started watching Star Trek, hearing about exoplanets, planets going around the distant stars we see in the night sky. I thought, yeah, I want to do that too. <laughs> so I just keep on racking up sort of the ideas. But also space. Um, I do lots of Earth observation. So satellites that go into space but look down at our planet to give us a better understanding of climate change, maybe a measure shipping in Singapore or something like that. You can measure a lot from space. But space also gives out that, that inspiration. We see our planet as a whole. No divisions, no borders, just our planet. And our planet is vulnerable in space. Sort of the dark velvet of space in our planet. And many people think that um, uh, um, images of our planet inspire the environmental movement because we suddenly saw our planet as vulnerable. So that, sort of that um, aspect of space just gives me such joy. <laughs> And when you were a child growing up with this fascination with Star Trek and the Clangers, did you visualise yourself as a space scientist or working in space? Um, it's funny because I think visualisation, which is one of the dyslexic traits, which is very powerful, really helps. If you can visualise it, so almost project yourself onto an idea, it makes it easier to sort of find a route to get to it. And so, yeah, it, I think it, sometimes in my wildest dreams, I thought, yeah, this might be possible. But it, sometimes it just seems very far away. But, you know, they say a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first steps. Um, I think when you can visualise it and sort of say, OK, yeah, maybe, maybe, then you, know, can you, sort of, you start taking the baby steps and you can get there. But, of course, there were so many failures on the way. <laughs> And my life has been littered with things that have just gone horribly wrong. And I've sort of sat there in the mud, you know, thinking, well, why? Why don't I just give up? But that's when the crazy dream comes in. And that's sort of that vision of you know, what could be in the future. And that's when you pick yourself up, say, OK, that didn't work. What next? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And having that big, crazy vision is such a dyslexic thing. It's sort of imagining the complete impossible. Why do you think that is? I think some people are the pioneers, the people who sort of look beyond the horizon and wonder what's there. And I think that is definitely a dyslexic trait. And I think we need more of that. Um, and we need sort of different people of different characters and sort of people working together. But that visionary, that person that says, you know, follow me, yeah, well, let's go and find out. Uh, and I think it is just innate in dyslexics. Um, and you can see it in sort of uh, in terms of entrepreneurs, sort of Walt Disney coming up with a whole new way of you know, communicating sort of you know, with cartoons. Um, Richard Branson coming up with a whole empire doing things differently. And so these people have to have that vision. And the vision can be big or small, but it's having that vision and then the will and the drive and the resilience to actually get there. Do you think as a child you always had that, that vision and the drive? 
It's quite interesting because I try and think back to myself as a child. And it's funny, I think I did. A sort of, uh, um, a, a sort of unexpected uh, determination. I, 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 I heard a term recently called stubborn optimism. And I think that's really summed me up because I'm optimistic. I'm sort of generally fairly jolly and I sort of have these visions and think, oh yeah, how can I go about that? Uh, but then I think some people have them and, and something goes wrong and they think, oh well. But I think what dyslexia teaches you is that resilience. And, and it comes out as something as simple as you know, just writing a document. Uh, I'm in sort of a word and I'm writing a document and I type in a word and it says, uh -uh. Think, oh rats. So I try and spell it another way and uh -uh. So, oh. Damn it. And so it tries, well, let's just use a different word. Okay, it knows that one. I can go on. <laughs> and so you build up that resilience. And as dyslexics, because we live in a sort of a world with round holes and we're square pegs, we have to find ways of doing things differently. So I think we build up that resilience and that can carry us so far. <laughs> with resilience, how did you deal with your negative thoughts as a child? As dyslexics, because we fail a lot and yes. because we're put down a lot yes. within education. We, we often tend to have quite a lot of self-doubt. Yes. Do you have that? And if you do, how do you deal with it? I do have that. I, th I think most people do. I think you have to be incredibly confident not to. And, and I think it is finding ways of building that confidence. So for me, there were sort of little things in my life which sort of just gave me that extra boost. Um, I remember an example, uh, sitting in a class, a science class, when I was probably about seven or eight, and the teacher asking a question. And the question was, you know, sort of, if a litre of water weighs one kilogram, what does one cubic centimetre of water weigh? As a dyslexic, I'm logical. I worked out that one cubic centimetre of water is a thousandth of a litre. Thousandth of a kilogram is one gram. So this should weigh one gram. I got it. And so I remember putting my hand up and the sort of teacher sort of you know, looking at me because no one else had their hand up. And being the dumb one at the back of the class, I put my hand down. But then the teacher you know, sort of smiled, I put my hand up and I got it right. And it's sort of that magical moment of, oh my goodness, I got that right. I used sort of my dyslexic brain to work something out. And so yeah, it is that moment of, if I can do that, what else can I do? And so I think every child needs those boosts of confidence so that when things do go wrong, and they always will, you get that sort of, okay, you know, things do go wrong, but look at this, this has gone right. And you've used your skills to do this. So where, what else can you do? What, how, how, how far can you take this? And so I think I had yeah, lots of support as well. Parents saying, yeah, yeah, it might take you longer, Maggie, but you can do it. <laughs> yeah, it's about celebrating those wins and building yes. on them, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> You've had a hugely successful career. I'm sure there's masses, masses more you're going to be doing. What do you think your seven-year-old self would think about where you are now? Oh, because uh, it's funny because uh, uh, as a dyslexic, I've always had big dreams. But I must admit, the sort of things I'm doing now, I think my seven-year-old would have been gobsmacked. Uh, I, I'm Chancellor of the University of Leicester. So little Maggie, a Chancellor of the University. Um, I had um, Mattel made a Barbie doll um, in my likeness. And I couldn't believe it. And when I was growing up, we didn't, Barbie dolls didn't look like me. So to have one that is actually me is mind-boggling. So I think my younger self would be gobsmacked. But pleased, but also thinking, okay, you've done that. What else can you do? Like, when are you going to make it to the stars? Get going, Maggie. <laughs> and just one last question. If you had some advice to give to kids who are struggling at school or, or young adults who are struggling, what would it be? Oh. So my advice would be believe in yourself. You have so much potential, you can do so much, but also get to know yourself. It took me many years to work out what my strengths and weaknesses are. And even working as a space scientist, I love doing the job, but there's a lot of paperwork. And so I think I'm a more effective science communicator. So I take the, sort of the discoveries that are made and I can share them with many people. So know your strengths and weaknesses and work to your strengths. And also I'd like to say, always say, you know, reach for the stars, no matter what your stars are. For me, my stars happen to be stars. I really want to get out there. Your stars might be anything, but have a big and crazy dream and see where it takes you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Maggie. Oh, it's lovely great. to speak to you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Join me next time when I'll be talking to the man who discovered the wreck of the Titanic, thanks to his dyslexic thinking. It's Dr. Robert Ballard.